and welcome to worship today. It is good to come into the presence of our God to worship him, to make much of his name, and also to be nurtured by his word. Welcome to those of you who are visiting with us. We're glad you're here. We pray that you'd be blessed in our time together. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 31, and in Psalm 31, we, we go to the beginning, we go to the end, uh, and, and the psalmist is confessing his faith in the Lord. He's confessing all the things that he sees the Lord doing for him, and yet at the end, he goes and, and tells God's people, he reminds them that they too might be built up. Why should they come to worship? And here's what we hear in this psalm. It says, In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Free me from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Mm -hmm. And then the ending part. Love the Lord, all his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Mm -hmm. So let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, as we hear those words and read them over and over again, we are reminded of your goodness and of your faithfulness, of your sovereignty, that you are the rock and the refuge and the fortress of all who seek you. And Lord God, that word provides us not just with comfort, it provides us not just with, with strength to be held on to, to be clung to in the, the most difficult times in, li in our lives, but Lord God, there's also that command to love you, and Lord God, that is what we seek to do today, that to love you, to express our love in song, to express our love in, in our presence and participation in this worship service. But Lord God, we pray that you would also instill in us, inflame in us that desire to love you each and every day of our lives. And for that love to, to flow out of us, that we might love others, even as we seek to love you more. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. As we come into worship this morning, let's stand to sing, Home. Thank God Almighty, I'll be free. 
streets are golden, every chain is broken. Oh, I want to go, oh, I want to go home, where every fear is gone. I'm in your open arms, where I Brothers and sisters, we look forward not just to that day when we are home with the Lord, but we know that he is with us here and with us now. And we receive this greeting from him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's continue to worship with a new song for this month, Back to Life. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. I won't forget the moment I heard you call my name Out of the grip of darkness Into the light of grace Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life Where there was dead religion Now there is living faith all of my hope and freedom I found in Jesus' name. Just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is of heaven before me, a grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. When something says I'm in guilty, I'll point to the price you paid. When something says I'm not worthy, I'll point to that empty grave. Just like that. thank you for all that you've done for me jesus to fully praise you it will take all eternity just like lazarus oh you brought me back to life oh you brought
You may be seated. In that song, I don't know that I have the words exactly right, but it talks about going from that state of, of dead religion to living faith. Uh, and you think about what we're about to read and, and use for our, our litany this morning, the Ten Commandments, uh, and those are a good example of that, right? right? There's a way to read the commandments and, and have it be just dead religion. Have it be something that, that tells you, look at all the bad things you've done. Try and just do these things, and you'll find that you can't do them on your own. You will fall short. And yet it's living faith that, that tells us, you know what, I, I, God says, I, I know that that's the case. I know that you can't do that. And yet I've saved you. Right? I've fulfilled all that's necessary. I've given you my righteousness, my perfect obedience that is in Jesus Christ. But I want you to continue to put these in front of you. I want you to continue to put these into action because they are the way that you are to live in thanksgiving. And so this morning as we hear these words and as we participate in this litany, as you see on the screen, I, I invite you to have that mindset. Right? As we implement them in our lives, it's not that we're just saying, well, these words were in the Bible a long time ago. I guess we better do them. But out of praise and out of such joy and gratitude for what God has already done for us in his son, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. we commit ourselves to loving him and loving our neighbor. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything, in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, your manservant or your maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. With, With God's, God's grace and, and the support, support of each, each other, as part, part of Christ's body, we promise, I will love the Lord our God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and my neighbor as myself. And may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our gracious God, we give you thanks that as we look at this list of commandments, as we look at this covenant that you made with your people, as we look at, at the conditions that you set before them, that, Lord God, we know we do fall short. We know that we have sinned in many of these. We have sinned in every one of these. We have not loved you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, there are times in our lives where we are just as guilty as Adam and Eve that, that we have had that question of, of, did God really say this? And that we say, well, we think we know better. We pursue a, a, a false sense of wisdom. We pursue a, a false sense of satisfaction. And Lord God, we find that, that, that what we receive on the other side, the fruit of that is, is fleeting. It is temporary. It is broken. It is a letdown compared to the perfect love that you have for us. And so, Lord God, as we go about our lives and we do fall short, we recognize the ways that, that sin entangles us, that the old self continues to, 
to cling on that, that this battle is not over between us and the devil and the world. Lord God, we pray that you indeed would forgive us, that you would restore us, and Lord, that you would renew us so that we would have in our minds, not because of ourselves, but only because of your Holy Spirit, that we would have in mind to love you and to love our neighbor well. Forgive us, O God, and thank you for the promise of redemption in Jesus Christ, sealed in his death, sealed in his resurrection. May we live into that today and for the life to come. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. Let's sing, Abide With Me. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. O Lord, our gracious God and Father, the Almighty One who sees all, who knows all, who is everywhere present, who sees all of time in His hands, and who chooses to love us. Lord God, how grateful we are that as we come before you this morning that we are able to claim that. That for all who have received the gift of faith, Lord God, they are your chosen people. They are the elect. They are those who you have loved. 
who despite all that is against us, despite all that we earn and deserve for ourselves, that you have chosen to save us. And Lord God, we know that's not just something for the future, but we know that you are at work. That you are at work in history, that you are at work in the world, that you are at work among different people, groups, and civilizations amidst all the, the tragedy and all the brokenness all the violence that has existed throughout all of time, Lord God, you are at work drawing your people to yourself and to your kingdom. Lord God, it is because we believe in you, it is because we trust in your sovereign power that we come before you with our needs, that we come before you with our concerns, with the things that, that burden us, with the things that cause us to, to cry out to you, perhaps in, in sadness, perhaps in, in need, perhaps even in anger, Lord God. That we are looking for you and, and we pound on the door of heaven hoping that you will respond, hoping that, that you will answer us. And Lord God, we have our ways that we want things done and yet we trust that you will give us that which you know is best. Lord God, we come before you with many needs this morning, with many things that that are not only in our bulletins, but that are on our hearts and minds, things that are, are real and that are painful and that uh, afflict us and our loved ones. And we pray, O oh God, that you would be merciful to us. Lord God, we lift up Patty to you this morning as she prepares for, for surgery this week, and we pray, O oh God, that you would allow that to go smoothly. That, Lord God, all the things that that the doctors are planning to do, that they might be able to do them, Lord God, the, the removal of, of the link system and, and the work that they do in, in her gastro system, Lord God, that all these things would go well and that they would bring healing and strength and ease to her body and to the things that, that she does daily that so many of us take for granted. Lord, be at work there. Lord God, we lift up Hugh Ethan again and and Lord God, as he continues to go through the chemo treatments, and, and Lord God, as there are, are smooth times and there are difficult times, Lord, we pray that you would be near unto him and his family. Lord God, be present and bring healing to his body according to your will. Lord God, we think of, of people who are farther away as we have the opportunity to give of our offerings this morning to Daniel Kabuji and, and Lord God, to support the work that he's doing. Lord God, to support his ministry to children in the orphanage and, and in Bible clubs around his community and, and the effect that that has even on, on others nearby. But Lord God, as he goes about his life and he continues to, to deal as so many in that part of the world do with, with yearly drought, Lord God, we pray that, that as much as we desire and, and hope and trust you for rain here among us, that, that you would provide that. Lord God, we pray out for, for Uganda as well for Kenya and for places in that part of the world that are suffering a multi-year drought. Lord, send rain upon them that it might nourish not only the ground, but that it might provide for, for simply the existence of the people there. Lord, we pray that you would uphold their faith in you, that they might be able to continue to trust you, that they would be willing to exalt you even in the midst of, of what feels like scarcity as they wonder when you will act on their behalf. Lord God, be with Daniel and his family and his loved ones. Lord, we think of others in, in this time. We think about next week and we have the opportunity to give of, of our offerings to, to Nico and Viviane. Lord God, and we pray that you would continue to, to watch over and, and bless them. Lord, as they have come into your love and, and begun to profess that, we pray that, that we might be able to continue to be a, a, an arm of that love in the midst of the offering, but Lord God, even in the problems of, of losing their home, may they continue to trust you and to see the ways that you are at work in their lives. Lord, we think of others too who are struggling in, in various ways, whether it's through cancer, whether it's being shut in and, and being immobile or infirm, Lord God, whether it's, it's simply a cold or a congestion that won't go away, Lord God, whatever it may be, Lord, we pray that your presence would be known and that if it be your will, that you would provide healing to our loved ones. Lord, we also think about what's going on in our, our country this weekend and, 
and, and the celebrations into this week of our Independence Day. And Lord, we give you thanks for, for this place that we call home. Lord God, for the benefits that we have, the freedoms that we have. Lord God, we take them for granted so often, and yet, Lord, we know that, that, that it is a grace from you. May it not be something that we take for granted, but Lord God, may we, may we share this. May, may our freedom and, and what it gives us the access to, Lord God, may we be willing to share that with others around the world. May we be willing to share the freedom to worship, the freedom to meet, the freedom to gather, and, and even just talk in the public square about our faith. May we be willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others without that fear of any punishment. But Lord God, this morning along with that, we also think of those who lead our country and serve on its behalf as we consider our, our president and vice president, as we consider uh, members of Congress, as we consider the, the Supreme Court justices, and, and Lord God, the difficult work that they have, and, and oftentimes that, that it goes unappreciated, that it goes even uh, attacked because they do things that, that we think otherwise about. Lord God, we pray that you would provide them with a heavenly wisdom, a, a wisdom that, that considers goodness and truth and justice, as well as mercy according to your will. Lord God, we pray for those who, who are serving our country in the military, and Lord God, we ask that, that you would be with them, whether they are near to home or, or far away. Lord God, we think especially of, of young men and women who are, are training right now and just beginning service in the military. Lord, lift them up, and we pray, oh God, that, uh, that even there that they might be a light and that the chaplains in our military might be a light that shines people again, that you are the rock, that you are the one who should be trusted against all men and against all governments and against all strength. Lord, allow us to rest in you. Lord God, now as we come into your word, we pray that you would provide us rest and refreshment there as well. Lord God, that as we focus on this theme of, of death and dying, of the ways that you are in control, that you have power in even the, the darkest and in, in, in the most unable to change parts of our lives. Lord God, would we be drawn to a greater trust in you. May we be able to, to praise you in the midst of not only joy and celebration, but also the midst of grief and death. Have your way among us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, even this day. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I know there's not many, but I'll invite you to come forward for our children's message. You guys are just here for candy, right? No? I think you are. What's up, Thea? All right. Can you get two pieces? We'll see. We'll see, Brooks. Well, guys, I have it printed out that I was going to have a good conversation with you about how I haven't seen you in, in the last month, and yet I kind of see you at home pretty much every day, right? Is that true? Most days, at least during the day. And then I go off to work. All right. Well, guys, a lot's been going on in this last month, and and we don't get to have children's messages very often, but there is something that we are doing from week to week, and that's working through one book of the Bible. What book of the Bible have we been looking at? Do you guys remember? The Bible? Yeah, the Bible, Thea. What? John? Not John, not Matthew, not Luke, but we're looking through Mark, right? And the Gospels, which Mark is one of, it tells us about Jesus' life, it tells us about his ministry, and we've been hearing about how Jesus would go around and people would come out to him and they would want to be healed by Jesus. Right? They'd be sick, they'd have their own problems, and, and they would come to Jesus and, and he, if they got to him, would fix them. Right? He would cure them, he would set them straight. But there's going to be something new that we're going to hear about this morning in our passage. We're going to hear about two different healings, but one of the healings is about a girl who had died. Right? She was 12 years old, and we're going to find out that she was really sick, and her dad can't do anything, and so her dad leaves her bedside, right? She is at home, and he goes and he finds Jesus, and he, he falls down on his knees, and he says, Jesus, will you come, and, and will you heal my daughter? 
And Jesus says, sure, I'll do that, right? And, and he goes with her, but before they can make it back to his house, right, some people come from the house and they tell this dad that his little girl, his 12-year-old daughter, that she has died. And that would be a hard thing to hear, wouldn't it be? Right, you guys are part of my family, and so you guys know we lost our daughter, right? We lost your sister. And that was a hard time, right? There's a lot of sadness, and, and as a parent, that's really hard. If you guys get sick, right, sometimes I'm, we're hard on you because we're saying get up and go do something because we don't realize you're sick. But then sometimes, right, eventually you're, you're sleeping on the couch, you're sleeping all day long, and we say, okay, we know something's going on, or you lose your voice, you're coughing a lot. And as a father, and, and, and your mom knows this too, right, that's hard on us, right? We want to take care of you. We want you guys to be healthy and to be able to function. We don't want to see you sick. It's hard on us. But when you lose a child, right, there's really nothing you can do. And, and so this man would have been in a really difficult position when he hears that message that, that, that your daughter is dead now, and yet Jesus comes to him really quick, and Jesus tells this man, he says, don't be afraid, just believe. That's what Jesus tells the dad who's just lost his daughter. Don't be afraid, just believe. And you think about, why did he come to Jesus? Why did I say he came to Jesus, Addy? His daughter was sick, and what did he want Jesus to do? He wanted Jesus to heal her, right? And so he believed in the beginning that Jesus is the healer, and Jesus says, keep believing that. Right? And so Jesus goes to this man's home, and, and he gets the dad, and he gets the mom, and he takes a few of his disciples, and they go into the room. They say, everyone else go away. And he picks up the girl's hand, and he says to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. What do you think happens? Why would I be telling you this story? You think she got up? She got up. This girl who had been dead, Jesus raises back to life. Right? That's an incredible thing. We see that elsewhere in the Gospels. We see that, that Jesus healed a man named Lazarus. We were singing about him before. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, and he was dead. He was buried in a tomb already when Jesus finally gets there. And Jesus is really sad, and yet Jesus is able to shout into that tomb and say, Lazarus, come out. And it's kind of a crazy story because it almost makes us think of Lazarus as kind of like a mummy. He has grave clothes on, and he comes walking out of this tomb. This dead man is alive again. Right? And so we're going to be listening today to the Bible, and we're going to be listening today to the message and hear about how Jesus, he's not only able to heal people who are alive, but Jesus has power even over death. Hey, Faya, let's calm down, okay? Jesus has power over death. Jesus can raise people back to life. And you and I, right, we, we get to look forward to that in, in the end, right? We were talking about that a little bit in our devotions at home this week, how there's going to come a time, right, when Jesus comes back. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes back, that the dead are going to be raised to life, that if we're still alive, we're going to meet them together, and that that is when Jesus will give eternal life to all who believe. Not just eternal life, but eternal life with him. That's an incredible thing that we get to look forward to. And that's, that's how Jesus has power, not just over death in, in our lives right here and now on this earth, but he has power over death for the rest of eternity. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for this day and thanks for the opportunity to talk about life and death and, and the difficulties of understanding that with our children. Lord God, we pray that, that as this is a real thing and that we know that there are many parents and grandparents and, and loved ones and friends of people who have lost children. Lord, that you are a God who not only gives us that promise of raising life in the future, but you are the God who gives comfort as well. And so, Lord God, for those who are hurting, we, uh, when we approach this topic, we pray that, that you would give hope, that you would give healing, that you would give a, a gratitude for what you have done and, and the promise of life that you give. But, Lord God, we pray also that this power that you have, this power that we read about in your word, Lord God, that it would drive out all doubt of you that we might have and that we might celebrate who you are and that you are a faithful God. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. All right, you guys listen really well. I guess you can have two things. I'm gonna, don't make me regret that, Brooks, okay? Don't make me regret it.
Well, I invite the rest of you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Mark 5. Mark 5, we continue to pick up where we left off last week, and that is at verse 21. We're going to be reading to verse 43. Mark 5, 21 to 43. And that's the extent of my intro. I know, surprise, surprise. Let's go ahead and hear the word of the Lord. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, so he's back on the north shore, the west shore of the Sea of Galilee, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she, so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been the subject to bleeding for twelve years years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, and yet instead of, give, of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd and he asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and she fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. But while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler... Jesus saw a commotion, with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and he said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And so after he had put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and they went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, we do not get to experience it very much locally, at least not where I've been around Baldwin or Hammond or Woodville, but, but perhaps you've been to some major event or some attraction where hundreds, if not thousands of people all want to be in the same place at the same time. And it's not just that they want to be in the same place, but, but they're all going in the same direction to the same location at the same time. I can remember back as I was growing up, we'd go to to Chicago White Sox games, and, and it was kind of reminded of, of the ramps at the end of the game. We would always sit like up in the upper deck, and the ramps after the game would just be flooded with people, and, and you'd be shoulder to shoulder bouncing around. Or you go to a place like SeaWorld or Disney World, and, and if you get there before the gates open, you're in this long line of people, and, and yet when they start to allow the ticket holders in, everyone moves. There is a surge of people. And I can say this jokingly, but, but sometimes, right, the, this surge of people, right, you, you move or be moved, right, it can end up quite tragic, right? They can start a stampede and people can be crushed underfoot. Well, a month ago, I somehow got this video, the, the video that this image on the screen is part of, as one of my recommended videos to watch online. Uh, and, and this image is, is taken right after I've been watching this train come into a train station in India in a major city during rush hour. And the platform is filled with people who are waiting to get on the train 
and, and yet you see the train rolling into the station, and it is already, in my understanding, full of people. There is no room. This is a train you're going to just have to let go by and wait for the next train. And yet as that train is slowing down to stop because it has to stop, there is this surge of people. Right? There's no patience. You don't allow people to get off just in case it's their turn to exit. But no, they want to get on. And so you grab on to whatever you can or you grab on to someone so that you can get a ride on this train. I don't know if there's separate men's and women's cars, men's and women's trains, but, uh, but this picture, this image, this video showed all men getting onto this train. I've seen other videos where it's all women and they're doing the exact same thing. And I'm, I'm not trying to make a comment about Indian culture to say that one's better or worse than, than what we do, uh, but I will say that to me this seems terrifying. Uh, and, and if I were over in India, I would find another mode of transportation. I want nothing to do with a train that is that full. But let it show us that different cultures have different ways of doing things. Right? And there's different levels of comfort when it comes to personal space. To some people, right, it may be perfectly normal and acceptable that we stand just inches away from each other's face and talk to each other. And a lot of us would say, hey, back up a few steps or else I'm going to back up. I don't want to be so close. Right? Or we're standing in line for something and we expect, you know, there's Maybe we don't need six feet, but I want three feet between me and someone. And, and yet you go to some places, and there you are, you are literally as close as you can be. You are packed in like sardines. And you don't need to say sorry, because it's, it's just how things are. But along with that, it's not just physical space, but specific types of touch that can mean different things. I had a handshake, or a high five, or a hug, or a kiss. Uh, in different cultures is going to mean different things. And, and there are different levels of comfortability. What you interact with a, a person of the same gender or, or how you interact with a, a person of the opposite gender or an older person and a younger person or someone who's family or someone who's formal. There's all different rules and expectations in different cultures. Even within our own culture, people might feel differently. But you say, why, Pastor, why are you going on and on this morning about physical space, about touching people, and what's acceptable? Well, this is why, because Jesus' ministry and Christian ministry in general involves contact between people. Jesus' ministry and Christian ministry still today involves contact between people. We've seen this in a variety of ways as we've been working through Mark's gospel. All the way back in the beginning, we heard briefly about John the Baptist, the predecessor to Jesus, the forerunner to Jesus, that he's out in the desert or, or the wilderness by the Jordan River. And do people just know that he's out there? No, people come to him to be baptized by him. Right? There's a physical presence part of his ministry. Right? We heard it early on in Jesus' ministry that, that in one of his first miracles, he goes into Simon's house and he holds the hand of his mother-in-law, who he's going to heal. Right, we hear over and over again how, how the crowds, they follow Jesus, the people bring their sick and demon-possessed to him. When Jesus healed the man with leprosy, chapter 141 tells us that filled with compassion, Jesus touched him. Right, a, an unthinkable thing in that society, Jesus touched the man. We read in chapter 2 how, how the paralytic friends, they, they had no room to lay their friend down to get him to Jesus. In chapter 3, the crowds came in such great numbers that, that they made it difficult for anyone else to come in. And, and even more so, the disciples in Jesus, they weren't even able to eat. But here we have it in, in chapter 5, and, and we're hearing about two occasions, two miracles, where that physical contact and physical presence continues. Right, The crowd is there, and yet Jesus somehow recognizes that one particular person has touched him. And he's healed by his power. And then at the end, we heard how he took this little girl's hand. And I remind us, and I share all these occasions with us that we've heard about, that we've read about, because Jesus was present with other people in all of them. Right? Compassion was shown by him through touch, or at least by clear care for other people. Uh, let me say something else here, right? Because we have to temper this a little bit. We know that from other miracles that people could be healed by Jesus without a touch. 
Right? We know the centurion who comes on his servant's behalf, his servant is sick, he is at home, and the servant says, I, I, you don't even have to come to my home, Jesus, but you can heal him. Right? So you don't have to be in the immediate proximity to Jesus. He can heal from anywhere. And so, too, despite the fact that this crowd, they were pressing so closely to Jesus, Jesus is not constantly emitting healing power out to anyone who rubs shoulders with him. Right? That's why the disciples say, hey, you, you have all these people around. How do you know that this one person touched you? Physical touch could be involved in healing, but it wasn't necessary. And the fact that people were touching doesn't mean that they were going to be healed. And yet part of what we see in all this is that Jesus' ministry involved contact of some sort. Right? People came to Jesus on their own or, or they came on someone else's behalf because of what they believed about Jesus. Because of what they had heard, because of what they had seen, and they said, I think he's worth going to. But it's not just kind of the, the image, not just the idea that Jesus put out, but Jesus made himself approachable. Right? No one who we've heard about was too sinful. No one was too sick. No one was too contagious. No one was too outcast or even too dead for him. His ministry was not just a preached word and, hey, go and, and broadcast the word wherever, but it was to be in contact whether it was to go to people or to receive people or simply be in the presence of people in such a way that they knew his love, Jesus' ministry was both word and deed. And Christians, not just pastors, elders, and deacons, though especially those of us who lead, right, we're all called into this type of contact ministry as well. Right, we're called into hands-on, being present with people ministry. Again, we've been praying this morning for a couple different things, a couple different offerings that we have in these first two weeks of July. We, we prayed for Daniel Kabuji this morning, right? And for the work that he's doing over in Africa. Next week we, we're, we have an offering and we're going to pray for, again, right, this couple and family in Brazil who we want to help with, with housing supplies. But quite often when we give to our general fund, like part of that is, is being dispersed out to different ministry share functions. It goes out to different organizations, but let's look at these two things that we're doing this week and next week. We know, many of you do at least, know Daniel. Right? You've had a relationship with him. We hear reports from him and, and his prayer request of what he needs during this time. But we also think about this family in Brazil, right? We got a video from them. And, and these actual connections, these personal connections that we're able to have, they, they help form a bond by which we can better pray for them and support them as well as to love them. Right? It's not just a request, but we know who the real people, the real recipients of the love are. And so that is a form of contact ministry, but we also can do much more intimate ministry at home. Right? When someone is grieving, we're able to surround them with love and encouragement, with a phone call, with, with visiting them at home. When someone's going to have surgery, we can pray for them, but we can also provide meals for them and, and, and make it a little bit easier but this also connects into a concept that came out of our synod this year in the CRC, and, and that was there's this idea out there of creating a purely virtual church, a church where your membership and your participation is only online. That was being proposed, and, and it ended up getting studied. That's the, the final piece of that is, is, is that we're going to look into this a little bit more. But on the floor of synod, there was a lot of pushback on that. And you might say, well, why? The internet, I mean, that's, that's popular today. Why wouldn't we try to, to have a virtual church out there? Well, the Synod wasn't mad that, that people are posting their worship services online. They aren't saying, oh, that's terrible. They're, they're not saying that, that there ought to be exceptions, that if you are, are in a nursing home or, or care facility or, or if you are, are not able to interact with people because of, of a level of contagiousness or vulnerability, Right, that you can't have ministry online. It, it wasn't to say, hey, church, don't do any ministry by phone or internet. But the pushback to this idea of a virtual church is that the model that we receive from Scripture of and for ministry is embodied. The church is embodied. It is a physical thing. 
Right? We meet together. We, we, we go to each other. We eat together. How we work through disagreements, how, how we are responsible for what we say and, and how we show love, all of that requires a certain level of physical presence with each other. And those are things that a purely virtual or online church simply cannot fully replicate. Jesus' ministry and Christian ministry still today require real contact between people. But that leads us to our second point. We just have two points today, and that's an answer to the question that I keep on bringing up. What do we learn about Jesus? What do we find about him that's different or unique? And you see the answer, that's our second point. It is that all power, truly all power, belongs to Jesus. We've witnessed him healing people. We've seen him release demons from people. We've seen him calm the storm. He has power over nature, but we haven't gotten to dying and death quite yet. And yet this passage shows us that Jesus has power over those too. And some of the scholars that I, I read from and, and looked at this week, they give that analysis that that is what this whole passage is about. Right? Sometimes you can look at this and you can say, well, Mark, he's just telling us the order of events. Right? The father came to Jesus and Jesus said, yep, I'll heal you. But, but then this woman shows up and he's got to deal with her and, and then he returns to the girl. Maybe that is all that's going on. But it's possible, as some others propose, that we are seeing that Jesus healed someone who was on their way to death before actually meeting someone that has literally died. And they ask the question, right, does the first miracle anticipate the second? Is Jesus showing, hey, I can do this while someone is alive, but I can also do this while someone is dead? All right, let's look at the adult woman's case first. Verses 25 and 26, she had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Again, as long as Jairus' daughter has been alive, she has been suffering. She has suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. She had spent all that she had, and yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Right? This woman's done it all. She, she's trusted who she's supposed to trust. She's followed through on what she's supposed to do. She's paid for it. And yet instead of getting better at all, things are just going downhill. Right? Neither dying nor death are mentioned with her, but ongoing blood loss is not good or sustainable for going on with life. Right, this is a woman who was in severe trouble. But what about the girl? Well, again, the girl, verses 22 and 23, the father, Jairus, he's also at his wit's end. Right, this seems to be a rather sudden case that his daughter is at home dying. He can do absolutely nothing, and, and so he, he, he leaves his daughter's bedside. And he goes and he finds Jesus. Perhaps he can and will do something. He fell at his feet. He pleads earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And yet they run out of time. Right? She dies before they can get there. Enough time passed that people gathered. They had professional mourners. One of the other gospels talks about how, how there were flute players. That was part of this mourning sort of ceremony that they did. When Jesus says the child is not dead but asleep, he's likely alluding just to what he's, he's about to do. He's not saying that, hey, you misinterpreted the facts or the reality. She is dead. It's not fun for us to talk about death. It's not easy when we've lost loved ones recently. It's not easy when we've lost loved ones in the past. It's not easy when we have loved ones who we know are fighting for their lives right now. And yet, let me remind you that these people, the people in this passage, they were not in comfortable circumstances either. But Jesus showed these people, and he showed those around them his power. And he shows them that death does not have the final authority. He does. Right? Yes, Jesus credits the woman her faith, but it's his power that healed her. Right? It's his power that caused her bleeding to stop and freed her from suffering. She couldn't go around and just touch anyone's clothes and, and get better. Right? No, it was Jesus. And so, too, when, when Jesus goes to this girl and, and takes her dead hand, her lifeless hand, and says, Get up, little girl. And she gets up and walks around. Not just anyone could do that. 
right? The father couldn't go into her room and pick up his daughter's hand and, and say, hey, please get up. No, this took the miraculous power of Jesus, his power over life and death and all between. The late theologian R. Allen Cole wrote this in his commentary about our passage. He says it was necessary that Jesus here be shown as Lord of life and death. This was an important part of, or an important proof of the Godhead. For it was supremely fitting that he who had created life even before sin and death entered the world should show himself master of death and the grave. More of this was an important piece of preliminary evidence of his own resurrection. He who had already conquered death for others would one day burst its bonds himself. Consider that, especially that first part. Right, the, the triune God that we believe in, the triune God that is eternal. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is God, and therefore Jesus has that part in, in creating life. And he's able to restore it, even when it appears gone. Right, Death, in our experience, it has finality. You can't do anything once someone is dead. Or so we think, because Jesus can give life to that which is dead. Jesus can give life to that which is dead. We know that from these miracles. We know that from Lazarus, as I told the boys and girls, we know that from his own resurrection. But we also get to see it in a symbolic way throughout Scripture. Right? That Jesus gives life to dead sinners like us. In Romans 6, starting at verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes, We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Right, but he's not just saying it about sin, but he says all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. But he's not just talking about a new life in our mortal bodies in this lifetime. Verse 8, he goes on to say, If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. And yet that promise of never dying again isn't just in the reality of Jesus, but it, it's the hope for us too. Right? Because Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, right, that we, if we have put our faith in Jesus, we too will be raised to life forever. Right? Why will we be given? Why? Because we will be given a new body. We'll be given a body that is spiritual, that is in power, that is in glory a body that is imperishable and immortal. And so there's a difference when we go back to Mark 5 that we do see a, a girl and a woman who were going to die again. Right At some point, their lives would end. And yet if they didn't just think back to this time and, and how powerful that guy Jesus was, but if they would believe in him to be their Savior and Lord, they could know the promise of being raised to life again. Jesus isn't just a reality for us while we're here in these bodies. Jesus isn't just someone that, that we say, hey, wish on Jesus, hope that there's something better, but then when we enter the grave, that, that all runs out. Right? He's not just someone to have that. Now we confess this in the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism. Join me on the answer, what is your only comfort, brothers and sisters, in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. The power of Jesus, the power of God, does not end at our final breath. He remains Lord and thus sovereign, over all that we are. If it is our time according to his will, whether we're young or old, it's our time. 
And yet we can trust that he will keep us. He will keep our children who have died. He will keep our loved ones who have died in true faith. He may extend our lives for a time beyond our expectations here on earth if he so chooses, even when we don't realize it. But do not forget that the the, the soul and the promised resurrection body is fully in the sovereign hands and will of God as well. While death is difficult, and we may pray that God will provide healing that will stall death, may we also trust in him in such a way that we understand we need not fear death. Amen. Let's pray. O Sovereign Lord, as we come unto you again, we are reminded of these truths that come through your word. That you are sovereign over all things, that you are sovereign and in control of of both our lives and in our death that you are sovereign amidst the sicknesses and and the tragedies that we live through and experience alongside of others. And yet, O God, you have this power. And there are certainly times in our lives where we would desire to see the same power come about, that you would, would bring our loved ones back to life that you would instill breath, that you would in, instill the, the pumping of the heart, that you would instill brain activity so that we might have just one more hour, one more day with a loved one. And yet you, according to your will and for your purposes, decide otherwise. Lord, we pray that you would allow us to trust you, that, that we would understand that, that you use your power according to your pleasure and for your glory. Lord, may we not give up hope in your power, but remind us again and again that that the resurrection unto eternal life, Lord, that that is so much better. Not just because we'll be together again, not just because we'll we'll be able to to, to be joyful and and to live life without tears or pain or sickness or death. But Lord God, that we are reminded that we have eternity with That is our hope. You are our hope. And so, Lord, free us from the fear of death, the fear of tragedy, and the fear of pain, that we may be reminded and remind others of your power over life and death and all between. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. At this time, our offering, again, for Daniel Kabuji is going to be received, and when... The offertory is done. I invite you to stand as our praise team comes forward, and we'll sing verses 1 and 2 of What Shall I Render to the Lord?
And now as we remember the wonderful work of Jesus, let's sing our song of response. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. Brothers and sisters, as we go forth from this place into the week to serve the Lord, and as we go forth to experience this continued cleansing from sin and living unto righteousness and gratitude, go with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. We close this morning with I am not my own. Oh.
Spirit, you assure me of eternity. 